Okay. So we're calling the public session of our meeting tonight to order at uh, 707. Uh, will the clerk please call the roll? Dr. Collins? Here. Dr. Jacobowitz? Here. Dr. Kaplan? Here. Dr. Kaplan? We have uh, all present. Um, I'd like to rise for the pledge. The pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Mr. Spicer? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I would like to begin our meeting with a moment of silence for the Trayford Pelham family and for the recovery of Jacob Blake, both our latest victims of excessive police force. Just one moment, please. Thank you. If everyone can keep them in your thoughts and prayers. Thank you. Uh, so we have two items coming out of executive session. Uh, resolution 2020 BOE 19. Be it resolved in accordance with section 1A of policy 921215 entitled non-aligned employees salary, benefits, and conditions of employment. That the Board of Education hereby approves a 4% increase to the salaries of the positions, current titles, and such policy, effective July 1st, 2020. I have a motion. And a second. Any discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Unanimously approved. Um, resolution 2020 BOE 21. Be resolved that the Board of Education, upon the recommendation of Dr. Paul J. Paolino, Superintendent of Schools, hereby approves an annual stipend in the amount of $29,091 to be paid to Gary Thompson for additional work as the Chief Information Officer for the Kingston City School District, effective July 1st, 2020 through June 30th, 2021. I have a motion. So moved. A second. Okay. Discussion? I think there's a lot more um, entangled with the distance learning and the hybrid model that we hope to get to, so I, I understand that need and I appreciate all the efforts. And this is a continuation of a stipend that he's been paid for four years, four years now. So he's going into the fifth year? <laughs> anyway, okay, so uh, any other comment? Call the question. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed, say nay. Abstentions? Unanimously approved. Um, approval of minutes of the August um, of the August fifth, two thousand twenty meeting to a regular public meeting. I have a motion. Second. Any corrections or changes? Okay, hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. 
abstentions. Unanimously approved. Minutes of the August 14th, 2020 special meeting. Um, I have a motion to approve those minutes. So moved. A second. Second. Okay. Moved and seconded. Any corrections or changes to those minutes? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Extensions being unanimously approved. Um, next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report. Dr. Palino. Thank you, Mr. Shaughnessy. Uh, I'd like to start off my report just with a, a statement. The Kingston City School District has been named as a defendant in a lawsuit by an anonymous plaintiff that was brought under the Child Victims Act which allows for persons who allege they have been victims of sexual abuse during childhood, but who did not commence litigation within the time frame previously applicable to such cases. Last year, the New York State Legislature passed a law that allows for allegations of sexual abuse against children dating back to the 1960s to be brought to court now. The allegations in this complaint against our school district and a former teacher concerns events that allegedly occurred more than 35 years ago. While the plaintiff was a high school student and allegedly commenced in private outside of school. The complaint against the school district appears to be largely based upon a general claim that it should have known of either a propensity of a teacher to engage in sexual abuse of students or that the teacher engaged in such abuse. The matter has been referred to the school district's attorneys and insurance companies. The case is in its very earliest stage and as of now the plaintiff remains unidentified to us. We will provide further information as this case proceeds. Thank you. Thank you. So next in the superintendent's report, I have our second century and capital project update. And Mrs. Siri is pulling that up on the screen for us right now. So we're going to start with what's going on over at Start with what's going on over at Miller and JFK. And what's going on there is a lot. I won't read everything to you. I think the pictures will tell you a lot more than you read, but we're really moving. Um, and we obviously we need to. Uh, while students aren't coming back on September 8th, our faculty and staff will be coming back, back on September 8th. So there's a lot of uh, the, a lot of manpower on the on the work sites right now and a lot going on. Maybe the next slide. Is our current work area, so you know where we are and where we're going to be completed. JFK, the curtain wall, if you take a ride by, you can see most of it's already up. It looks amazing. Uh, the site work looks looks a little a little rough right now, but um, it's getting there, and we'll be planting grass and fixing the, the site area, but the sidewalks are new. The parking lot's in great shape. And the elevator we're still working on. It be, won't be completed until October 2020, but that's really on the outside of the building, so it won't impact our faculty and staff uh, entering the building. Miller also, the curtain wall. Again, we'll show you some pictures in a few minutes, but it looks really, it's, gonna, it's going to be um, great when it's done. Um, the site work is being finished right now, and punch list uh, does look a little rough there too, but there's, there, that'll be finished up. And the auditorium renovation is kind of in mid in mid uh, year, and will be done by the holidays in December of 2020. And Edson boiler installation will be completed by the end of August of 2020. And we're, we're pretty, well, obviously it is the end of August 2020, but we're, we're pretty much buttoning things up there too as well. And there is the boiler at Edson. So it's just waiting for the piping to put in. If, if you remember the, the original pictures of the boiler there, it was a, they were kind of a, a much older looking um, system. This is new efficient system for, for Edson. So we're happy we were able to, stick, to sneak this into this part of the project. More of the boiler room. Then there's the gas meters, the relocation of that. Okay, so here's JFK putting in the sidewalk and the curbing. Uh, that this that's already done, but this is when it was happening. And if you look to the left, there is a mysterious man stand shadow there. It looks like he's in a mm -hmm. overcoat and a hat. It's very <coughs> creepy. 
Um, next. More on the sidewalk, and you can see here's more a little uh, of, of what it looks like done. Obviously, not, don't walk on it, but it's done. More of the site work. This is the dumpster pad, and there were some questions about the dumpster pad last time we're here because it's very large, but it needed to be large that this way it could fit the, the, K, the JFK dumpsters as well as hold the, the capacity of the truck that goes up the ramp to pick it up. So they have it, it has to be built to certain specifications. So it does look pretty extensive for a dumpster pit slab, but um, it's, it's built to serve its purpose. New stairs. Mike Rocks, <coughs> putting in new fire hydrants where we ripped the sidewalks out. Okay. HVAC, new ceramic tile and, and plumbing fixtures in the bathroom. And this is just so you see, these are just some material deliveries for the duct work. And I say there's still a lot going on there. So you see, in some classrooms, there's still some. Duck work sitting around, but we're getting that up quickly. Again, more duck work being put in in the fan room. Here's here's some pictures that are um, my favorite pictures here. Right, the JFK curtain wall, the difference it, it makes in the in the appearance, uh, the new windows, you know, a whole new look for the front of the building. That's the back, same thing, putting the new curtain wall in. Yeah, that's. This, now we're into Miller. Okay, so there's just some new, some new um, overhang. Auditorium's getting going. See, there's no chairs in there. I know that makes several people on board happy because they were very happy with those orange chairs. So they're gone, um, and we're basically stripping that to the to the place down. There's the courtyard where the new curtain wall will go. So those windows have been removed, and now the new curtain wall will go up. There's what it will look like. As you can closer to that. If you go back here, could you go back one? So here on the right, you'll see this is kind of what it will look like with the whole building when it's finished. Very similar to the JFK look, but um, again, so much better. And the windows all are operable, and we won't have the problems we had, um, you know, in the past with so many window issues at Miller. Thank you. And they're insulated. They're they're double insulated. insulated. And they're and they're, they're um, yeah, they're modern. They're uh, energy efficient. So now we'll go on to KHS where a lot is happening there too. Okay. So the things that are going on right now uh, you know, a lot of different things going on. You know, we're finishing up a lot and starting new things. So, um, you know, there's so many different things going on. But there's some some of the most um, the things that are going to be most dramatic for you. I think we'll be looking at the front steps and looking at the Winston Tobin uh, demolition. Um, those are it's some it's interesting to see, and it's it's dramatic. And so you will remember when OJM came down, how dramatic that was. So, if you go to the next slide. So these are our current work areas. As we, as we run the ground floor east, that's done pretty much. We were done. The punch list is generated and being ready. It actually is generated already. That's being uh, taken care of right now. Elevator installation will be done by the end of this week. Tobin Winston demo. You know, it's to be cleaned by it's completed by the end of the fall. But you'll see the pictures of that. And it's really the site work that will be completed by the end of the fall that needs to be done now. The demolition is pretty much uh, done. It's just clearing the area. Music wing is going to be the rest of the year, as we know, and the first and second floor of West is going to be the rest of this year. So some new sidewalks coming in along the, the east area there between the field house and, and main. New steps being worked on. So they've removed all the old stone. They're setting the new steps, and then they'll, they'll put new stone in so the stairs will be um, even and uh, impressive. That we're going to look like. Fieldhouse bridge flooring. We did the flooring. You can see we're also redoing the ceilings. You can see those the ceiling tiles are out right now. New stairwells at the ends of the at the ends of Main. There's the windows there. The stairwells actually aren't new, but the windows are in there, and that's an impressive looking tower. 
just framing and, and plumbing. More framing down on the uh, in the first floor in west. More duct work, etc. Framing all over like the second floor west. Thank you. So continued. There you go. The, the dark room we kind of saw this last time. I put it up twice because a lot of people didn't believe we we're gonna have a dark room, so we wanted to keep it in here. So we do have a dark room. <laughs> there, there it is. A completed dark room. One of the ground floor classrooms that's complete. Adaptive PE. And this is our digital photo computer graphics room. It has a collapsible wall, and big space, uh, an extra large space for that that program. Family and Consumer Sciences, I believe we saw this last time, but I don't think the appliances were in that out. Again, ground floor restrooms, they all pretty much look the same in the building now. And here is Tobin Whiston, partial demolition there. And then you see the next scene. Whiston, Tobin Whiston is no longer with us. And there's a different angle, so you can see the new Kingston High School over on the left side of the screen and right down here where that large excavator machine there is, is where Tobin Whiston used to stand. <laughs> so yeah, so that's, again, and then field, field house, lo a pool locker, I know uh, people on the facilities committee remember this was an issue. Um, we, we finally have this done, this is completed, it had to be redone, um, you know, this is I think the third time with a new contractor and we settled all those issues and now we have a con the new floor that's consistent with the other floors and the other locker rooms throughout the field house. And there's the Dectron installation. For those of you who don't remember what the Dectron is, the Dectron is the air purifier, for lack of a better term, for our pool. Um, we had one, it was very old, um, it needed to be replaced. It was, it was working, but on its last legs, uh, we wanted to replace it, and anyone who has friends or family on the swim team will be pleased to have this new system in place. Uh, I think it's gonna do a lot for the environment inside the pool. And that is it for our building projects that are going on right now. Anybody have any questions? I have a question. The, um, I drove by through the driveways of the high school Today, actually, and uh, on the east side of Maine, there are new are those new concrete steps yes. going up. There's two sets of them. Yes, and those are brand new. The old ones were right. the old ones were jackhammered out. And new new steps were put in there. Yes. Okay, quick. They're nice. Yes, and much okay. big, much improved. Yes. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Uh, are we all back on the screen? Yes. Any questions on? Uh, the reopening, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, capital projects. Okay. Dr. Farrell has another report. Okay. Um, as you all know, last Friday our um, reopening plan was um, edited, let's say, to, to move the district to an all remote learning plan. So we were required by the State Education Department to, to have our remote learning plan posted on our website, as well as our um, tracing and testing plan. To just speak to that for one second, the testing and tracing plan was developed in coordination and collaboration with the Ulster County Department of Health. And it is the county-wide um, approach to testing and um, tracing. So we are working collaboratively, all, all school districts in Ulster County with the Department of Health, we all have the same procedures, same practices, and we will all handle issues within our buildings when students return, or, or if they are faculty issues, um, in the same manner. And that is the, the way in which the Department of Health has directed us to do that. And we, we appreciate them stepping in and creating um, a county-wide approach to this. Um, as opposed to a district-wide, and I think most of you know that if one district does it one way and another does it another way, there's always going to be speculation of who's doing right and wrong, and now having the um, health officials 
create the plan for track for tracing and testing helps us be consistent and it also really quite honestly don't have the resources to test and trace so the county stepping up with that is, uh, is great and I, I want to thank the Department of Health and the county executive for um, all of the cooperation and collaboration and, and the work that they've done to assist the school districts in that area so the remote learning plan was posted on Friday, and I, I do want to thank the Board of Education for your patience and, and your support. And um, I know I've had conversations with almost everyone on the board over the last week or so about this, um, and, and I appreciate your input and your concerns and your questions, and hopefully um, we can do our best to answer those, not only tonight, but as we go forward in this process. I said about the, about the, re or the reopening plan, uh, what I'll say about the remote planning, this is a living document. We're going to learn a lot as we move forward. Um, this is an imperfect, imperfect situation. Um, we are learning. We learned some things today and made some changes. So we, but we are um, open to that. We'll look and be flexible and nimble and do what's best for our students as we learn um, more when going through this process. Um, I also want to thank Mr. Burge and the Teaching and Learning Department. Uh, Ms. Bonville for her work with the secondary and Ms. Uh, Dr. Belsella for her work with the elementary. Uh, this plan was developed not only with our building administrators, our central office administrators, um, our, uh, we have more than 175 teachers um, participate in focus groups and conversations to develop this plan. So we really tried to cast our net and get this thing done as quickly as we could. Again, short timelines, but um, we're gonna, we put our best foot forward and we're going to be, as I said, nimble and flexible and make adjustments that are best for kids and best for families as we move forward if necessary. So that being said, I will just kind of go through the highlights that are posted on our website. Again, the, the what to expect has been something I've been using with our, with our um, community forums, our community town halls, our, our virtual town halls, they've been calling them. So, you know, what to expect. Our primary focus will be students' well-being and maintaining connections with them. Students will use, continue to use Microsoft Teams. Teachers, administrators, teaching assistants, and all support staff will be present in their buildings and available every day. And again, this is a, one part of our effort of trying to make sure that families can use the same, you know, um, strategies and same, some, same modes of communication every day to get to hold somebody. You need something if your student's in the building, call the building. If you need some of your students on remote, you call the building. Um, that's where our teachers are, that's where our principals are, and we'll be there ready to support. Instruction will be both synchronous and asynchronous to try to cater to every every learner in our district. Live, but live contract, a live contact with the teacher will happen every single day. Lessons will be aligned with New York State standards. Students will need to engage daily, utilizing the schedules contained in the plan. Students will be given regular feedback and checks for understanding. Parents will receive weekly communication about assignments for students, and including building principal messages every week. Our students with disabilities IEPs will be followed, and the services will be provided by, to all students with disabilities or students who have a 504. Our social emotional learning support will be continuously provided through the remote learning period and beyond. Technology will be provided by the district when necessary. We just closed our survey today, so we have a pretty good handle on what we need and we feel confident that we can do this. Technical support for families will be provided by our IT department as it was in the spring. That was an area of great strength, I believe. Our CTE programs will be phased in in accordance with the Ulster County BOCES plan. So our students who are taking CTE will be phased slowly into in-person learning down at, um, over at Port Ewan or whatever location they are doing their CTA program, CTE program. Response to intervention, academic intervention services, and English language service, English language learning services will be scheduled on an individual basis to meet the students' specific needs. And students who are in out-of-district placements will attend those programs that are open for in-person um, in person instruction. So, students who are, have students with disabilities and are out of district placements will be going to their location in person, and we will be providing them transportation. And regular status updates regarding status of in person instruction will, will be continuously communicated through families, um, through our communications department, and more uh, virtual town halls as we keep going. And hope maybe at some point we'll have small, we can have small crowds for, the, for our town halls. 
I won't read everything to everyone, but you know, we have some we have some learning goals. Uh, as I said, connect with students and daily, uh, daily and with families as much as needed. To focus on student engagement and learning. To ensure equity and equitable education opportunities for all of our students. Focus on social emotional health was our, has been our focus in lot when we were in person before the before the state of emergency. It will continue to be so. And provide students with specific <coughs> feedback, which is something that you know was a real concern and was concerned in the spring. And make sure we have a supportive and inclusive, uh, and inclu in supportive and inclusive program. Expectations and roles of the students. Again, there's they don't change very much from our expectations during the regular school year. We expect them to engage during live class, during their live class, or during class chats and check-ins. We expect them to self-advocate and let the Everest, let us know what their needs are and how we can support them. We expect them to adhere to scheduled classes and complete all assignments by deadlines. Be respectful to others and teachers during the classes and chats. Complete assignments with integrity. Engage in learning as much as possible. And reach out to teachers if help is needed. Again, that goes back to our self-advocate for our students and students. Families' responsibilities. We continue to, and this is a two-way street. We want you know, them to review our communication from the district, understand that, that we have available uh, supports, and, but we also have expectations around online distance, remote learning, whatever we want to call it. Um, but again, we have a role in that. We, have, we, have to, we want them to review the communication, but we need to know that we, and make sure we are communicating effectively um, throughout this process. We ask people as we look to create favorable conditions in the homes for productive work, have a quiet space for your student. A quiet, organized space for your students to do their work. Hold students accountable for engaging in his or her learning. Uh, we want to help parents with this. How, and one of the things we spent some time in the spring speaking to parents who have asked that exact question, how can I work that we can continue to motivate my students in this situation? So those are things we're working on and we'll be working with parents on. Create a consistent daily routine. And again, that's part of the scheduling process that we put in place. Um, you know, one of the, some of the feedback we received from parents was the lack of routine for their students and really creating problems at home. Provide your child with frequent encouragement and reminders as needed. Be patient and flexible with yourself and your child. And reach out to the Kingston City School District Tech Support for help or really reach out to us for any kind of support that is needed. Our teachers' roles and responsibilities, again, not much different from what they are if they're teaching. Our expectations are different if they're teaching. We, you know, we expect them to connect, to connect with families. Um, and we expect them to engage in the PD training and find platforms for best practices, which we're putting together right now, uh, to plan their content delivery based on a schedule and have their, have their asynchronous instruction posted every morning. Collaborate with their colleagues to plan and support students' needs. Again, this collaboration, especially now where we, we'll have breakout rooms for students who get, who get specific, um, you know, specific modifications or when we have team teaching, again, collaboration with their colleagues is going to be important. Providing feedback to students within the week of the assignment the task is completed. That's you know one of the things with remote learning is that constant feedback, that give and, the give and take of information for students to keep them engaged. We want all of our assignments to be in not only in e school gradebook, we really want them in our Teams program, which has been updated to have a really robust uh, assignment. Uh, section, which will also generate communication letters for parents, let parents know what their students' assignments are, how their students are doing, so it will automatically come to parents every week. Again, just further um, establishing our communication with parents during this time. We need to make accurate records of interactions with their students, including whole class, small group, chats, phone calls, emails, just need to know that they are making those, those attempts. Uh, again, we also have more um, capability now that now the Teams has really turned the corner and is becoming more of an educational platform than a business platform, where we can really look in and teachers can look and see you can see what what are kids what students are um, participating and are they engaged, and we can help teachers with that and principals with that as well. Team faculty department meetings, you know, via Teams as scheduled, and implement appropriate communication guidelines with their students. And as much as this is a difficult time. Um, this is also, you know, it's a difficult time for our teachers also. So we, we really like to have each teacher create some boundaries. Um, I spoke to so many teachers in the spring who were getting 
chat messages and text messages and phone calls late, late at night. And um, you know, there, there are some boundaries that need to be set up and I think working, you know, each individual teacher would know how to do that, but we're encouraging them to do that for their own uh, you know, social emotional health. Again, our staff, our support staff, collaborate, connect with families, provide support, keep their principals you know, uh, up to date on everything that's going on regarding their students, especially when we're looking at attendance. That's one of the big things we're looking at, and be available for students and families to address their needs quickly. Just quickly, we've had the, the minute, you know, we, we're really going by minutes of instruction and how we can make sure that those, we're meeting those minutes of instruction, but also that that's much shorter than the hours within the day. Um, at our pre-kindergarten, this is gonna be 60 minutes of instruction every day. Instruction can be modified to each classroom and community, you know, best community to account for all learning situations. Um, so we're trying to keep that recommendation for schedule, but be flexible and adjust to meet the needs of students. All classes will be synchronous and asynchronous. So that's gonna, that's gonna be a constant, you'll hear me say synchronous and asynchronous, so we can really um, cater to all learners. K through, K through uh, two, very similar to our UPK, uh, night only more time, 90 minutes. Struct, you know, again, instruction modified within the, the time period during the day, um, being flexible, making sure our AS, related service and EL service will be scheduled on an individual basis. Um, and again, we're gonna adjust the schedule to accommodate other services that need to be provided. Um, synchronous and asynchronous learning will happen. Three and four, 120 minutes. So as you see, we go up the grades, the, the number of actual instruction in minutes will be, uh, are growing. Instruction can be modified again, as we said, um, being flexible, making sure students get their AIS related services and their L's are being serviced and adjusting our schedule. Uh, and then having the asynchronous and synchronous. And I do want to point out, if you look at the students on the bottom, they grow along with our slideshow. <laughs> and I want to miss, give Miss Siri credit for that because she did that. <laughs> Next. Five through eight. Uh, so our middle school students will follow their regular daily schedule. This is a change. This is a change from what we did last week. Um, last week we had more of a block type schedule after this was originally posted and feedback from teachers and parents. Uh, we, they found it confusing. Uh, they found it uh, difficult um, to navigate. And we wanted to make sure that we were being as simple you know, as possible for people to understand what they need to do and when they need to do it. And also, uh, when we looked at the five through eight, one of the issues we had was no standalone services for our L students, which is the, the normal thing at five through eight. And this schedule allows us to, to do that. So we're, we're feeling that this, while different than our original intention, does provide them with their 180 minutes and does provide um, you know, the, the structure and simplicity that uh, we had a pretty good size um, kick back on this that we felt that a change would be appropriate. And again, all classes will be synchronous and asynchronous. Kingston High School, similar to the middle schools, they follow the regular daily schedules. 35 minute classes per day, all classes are synchronous and asynchronous. A little different, a little less flexibility as we go up um, into the grades, as you know, and, and you know why, uh, given seat time requirements and regents expectations. So uh, as we go up, the flexibility goes down, we know that, um, but we are also working as far as uh, synchronous and asynchronous with our students and working on what we can do as far as developing a schedule around possible a night school also for some, for some of our students who um, aren't able to engage during, during the school day. But again, 180 minutes of live instruction, having synchronous and asynchronous throughout is, is an important part for us. And then I'll point to the students at the bottom who are now fully grown. I always just wanted to put this out because this is a question I was asked a lot, and this is going to change starting tomorrow, I think. Um, but we have uh, about 595 masks, we have 1,500 surgical masks, 500 space shields, 300 boxes of antibacterial wipes, 50 boxes of gloves, assorted sizes for all people. Um, so expected from the county, uh, reusable cloth masks for every student staff, and staff member. 200 K N95 masks, which is a little different than the N95 mask, but uh, highly effective. And surgical, further surgical masks and more gowns, which is an important piece. It's one of the pieces of PPE that I was worried about. Um, our goal with our PPE, and we've ordered, and I think we're meeting that goal with the exception of a couple items, it was to have three months 
of PPE on stock in stock here, stockpiled. So um, I give Mr. Uh, Silverstein a lot of credit. He jumped in, took over that process, and has been working with uh, our COVID-19 director, who a coordinator, who is uh, Naomi Stevens, our lead nurse at Kingston High School. And they've been working together, and they've really searched out and created a great program or a great uh, structure and organization around the purchase, stockpiling, and distribution of our PPE. Still concerned about the hand sanitizer and the gowns. We'll see what we get from the county. Tomorrow is our pickup day for for, um, for PPE from the county, that, that the county is giving us. So they do have some gowns, so we'll probably get a few from them. But we are, again, they're disposable gowns. So it's a one-use item, and they are going to be heavily used in our nurses' offices and some of our special ed classes. Um, still, still working on the hand sanitizer situation. But other than that, I think we're in, we're in very good shape and uh, a lot of credit to uh, Mr. Silverstein and, uh, and Naomi Stevens for getting that together. And now, um, any questions? Any, any questions? This is Jordan. Uh, will there be any way of distributing um, either books or other materials that children will need at home and um, to get them off the screen, like maybe to have, you know, group sets of uh, reading books and things like that, that they usually would use in classes. Is yep. there an availability in that? Yes. Each building principal is putting together pro a process for um, distribution, not only one time. So we're going we're gonna to have our Chromebook distribution coming up next week for all of our students. In that Chromebook distribution, textbooks or manipulatives or things like that that we can put together now to get to them, we'll do that at that time. But we're also putting together a process for their teachers to be able to hand out other items that they need, whether they be you know novels for a high school student or textbooks for a middle school student or other items that you know uh, reading materials for our elementary school students. So we are going to have a process in place that's going to be. I don't want to say it's going to be constant, but it's going to be, uh, you know, a continuous flow. As things are needed, we're going to create opportunities. And again, that, that does create a small opportunity, a small window for some in-person engagement with the teachers um, and the students during that time. So, yes, yeah, so every, every building principal is putting together the process for that right now. Wonderful. Thank you. I have a question. Uh, the gloves, are they just going to be used by the nurse? Um, anybody who wants to use them. I mean, the nurse's office obviously is going to be using the gloves most often. Um, but again, high, you know, some of our teachers work in high contact classrooms and may, may choose to wear gloves. Uh, we want people to, you know, if, if they feel that certain PPE is what they need to make them comfortable to work in their space, uh, we want to have it there to provide it for them. And another question I have is uh, the schedule for the all the students, are they out yet? No, they were going out. They are going out this week. Thanks. Okay, Dr. Jacobowitz. Um, you had mentioned in a previous meeting that uh, Teams was coming up with new functions that would enhance teaching and instruction. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the new functions that have come out on Teams and how you envision those being used by our teachers and how the teachers will be trained on that. So we are, uh, and I think. The cabinet level team got trained uh, Monday on some of the updates on Teams, and if we, if our next board meeting is um, virtual on Teams, we'll be showing off some of those new um, features here during the board meeting. But uh, so, just for example, one of the biggest complaints about Teams was I can't see all my students. Now you can. You can see up to 50 people on the screen at the same time. Um, so there, that was that's a big that's a big change. Um, also, we have the opportunity to put students into classrooms instead of looking in squares, like we're looking at you right now, squares in squares. If, if Karen wanted to, she could put you, she could press a button and put you all into a classroom where you're sitting in what looks like a looks like a lecture hall. So, it, so it, it gives order things. Um, students, when they raise their, can now raise their hand digitally within the Teams. Uh, program, you could do that also if you wanted to. But when the students do it, a, a, the student is highlighted, so the, a, a yellow uh, ring surrounds them. So it's just another visual cue for teachers. Um, so th those are kind of the, the the tricky things. But I think the biggest 
um, improvement that we saw was the assignment um, area, which is much easier for teachers to use, much easier for parents to read. One of the requests that we received um, from the most parents was, can I please have a one place where I can find everything that my student needs to do? And instead of having to look six or seven in places and go into different breakout rooms or go into a different team. So now there's one space within, within teams, assignments, you go there and every, every class, every assignment will be there. And every week on Saturday morning, uh, I don't know if it's gonna be morning, I shouldn't say that, on Saturday, sometime during Saturday, teams will automatically generate an email home to parents of the students' assignments, what they've done and what they have due. So, the, so you, you will get a weekly, parents will get a weekly report of their students' um, classroom assignments, classroom engagement, and things that are due coming for, moving forward. Do you have another question, Dr. Strobe, it's a sorry hand again. I just want to follow up. Thank you so much for that. That's such a relief as a parent trying to navigate that in the spring was complicated. Um, and I'm glad to see or hear about the updates. And I know there's possibilities for breakout rooms and kids to meet in small groups, even virtually. And I think that's exciting. Um, one thing that the district did well, I thought, in the spring, among many things, but one of the things that they also did well was that there was this great infographic on how to log on to Teams and how to navigate it. And I'm hoping that we can put that out again with some of these advanced features also so that parents know how to access these different spaces and they'll know what to expect. Absolutely. This is Siri is writing that down right now as you say it, so we'll make sure that we communicate that. And tell Mrs. Siri that I noticed that all the kids were growing. <laughs> I noticed that. And, and Dr. Jacobus did mention something that I didn't. The breakout rooms is a new feature. So uh, you, any of you who've been in Zoom meetings know that you can put the, the, you can create breakout rooms. And I know I've been in several meetings with State Ed where we've been putting in the breakout rooms. So now Teams now has that ability to put in the breakout rooms. So our teaching assistants can work in breakout rooms with small group, have a small group instruction. Um, our teachers can you know do different things. We have small study groups. We have students doing you know cooperative learning in small groups in a breakout room. So uh, that's a new feature that we think is is really positive. Dr. Collins had her hand up first and has been ignored so far. Thanks. Um, I just noticed on um, social media that and other places that there's been some kindergartens that have had meet and greets, which I think is just wonderful. And I'm curious if there's any, any more standardized or um, structure for other kids and maybe their parents as well to be able to meet teachers at any point very early in the process? Each, uh, yes, uh, each of the buildings is coming up with their plan for how they're gonna do meet and greets. We wanted to start with the kindergartens, obviously, but yeah. each, we, we you know, asked each principal to put in place a plan for you know, brief, slow, you know, uh, distance, socially distanced meet and greets with their, with their students. So those will be happening throughout the next couple of weeks. Monday morning, the meet and greet will be here for our pre-K students. If you want to come and watch that, I'm sure that would be unbelievably interesting. Um, but yeah, That's so fun. we're doing it at every, so we, building principals are in charge, but they will be putting something together for um, their students between now and the beginning of school. Oh, great. Thanks. Mr. Spicer? You're muted. Dr. Catalina, did you want to share any, uh, any updates or, or changes to the breakfast and lunch program while in remote learning status? We are working on that right now, actually. So we're going to improve that significantly. That was one of the areas I really wanted to see improve. Obviously, we got caught off guard in March. That's, and, you know, um, serving food the way we did is not what we do. <laughs> you know, we're a cafeteria type operation. But Mr. Corelli and his team and Mr. Olson are working and I'm expecting a plan from them within the next couple of days that we will promote far and wide to make sure parents and, and, um, and families know. We are also working, um, I know there's a lot of concern, these two things are kind of related, but I'm gonna go into it. I know there's a lot of concern around childcare and we are concerned about childcare as well. We've been working with the YMCA. We've been working with uh, the Healthy Kids Program and just today I was working with um, you know, our, our partner CCE and all three of them along, along with the Boys and Girls Club, um, the Hodge Center, and this afternoon I met with the mayor to talk about the Rondout Center and how these, these places can um, provide some um, childcare while assisting with our remote learning program. 
Uh, we're looking at every different way we can help them, whether it be um, sending support instructionally, our teacher assisted instruction, social workers, uh, but we're also, we also, we, we can feed those students that are there. So we're looking at, you know, we think our capacity for childcare is, is, is going up dramatically, very quickly with these conversations with our community-based organizations. So I appreciate um, the YM and uh, the HUD Center and the Boys and Girls Club and CCE uh, really stepping in to the, help us fill that void um, during this time. But that's gonna be a captive audience for us to serve um, lunches and breakfast to as well. And are we still using People's Place as one of our sites? Um, well, People's Place really wasn't one of our sites last year. It was a you know, was that where we were, it was a distribution site where they helped us there at the y YM. Uh, right now, we're again still still creating our plan, um, but I should have that to the board probably by the end of the week, and then out to the public by Monday or Tuesday. Thank you. Well, more questions, Doctor um, Doctor Jacobowitz. Um, we had spoken earlier on about having some spaces that might be available for students who were having trouble connecting remotely um, to come into school and um, I don't know, use the library supervised, of course, so that they could actually access computers and Wi-Fi from that space. I don't know, um, I'd just like to hear your thinking on that. I don't know if that falls under the child care umbrella that you were just talking about, which I so appreciate because I know how important that is for our community and for our teachers. Um, but if you could talk about that a little bit, that would be great. Yeah, that's kind of a work in progress. Uh, you know, it's the, um, with short deadlines and with what we've been asked to do, I always, I always use the phrase, we're gonna feed the wolf at the door. Um, and the wolf at the door was to get the remote learning plan done. And then we can take our time and, and take, some, take a look at some of those um, opportunities. But I think, again, having just our teachers in the buildings provides an opportunity for space where we can have some small groups come in if necessary. Uh, we're, and just to expand on that, uh, we're, when we're talking about going back to our hybrid model, uh, we're continuing to work for, look for space. Um, we're, again, we visited Tech City. Uh, we're reaching out to you know, different areas where we think we may have uh, an opportunity. Um, you know, there may be some space at the old Zena School that we're gonna go out and look at Friday morning. So um, we are actively looking for more space so we can bring more students in uh, as soon as we think it's safe and we're ready to do so. Um, and we're uh, removed from the remote learning program. Um, but yes, and I, I, I went on bird walk there and gave him more of an answer than you needed. But the answer was, is yes, I mean, those are still uh, possibilities and opportunities that I know, uh, speaking with uh, Ms. Bonzo and Dr. Dalcello, those are things that they would like to see happen for those students and, um, and to provide that support. So. Dr. Collins? Um, this actually may be fall under that child care, fall, uh, oh, sorry, child care umbrella that you just referred to and we will learn more about in the coming weeks. But I was curious if the school buildings will be available for the programs that have previously been licensed to operate them, like the YMCA was using the gyms and the cafeterias at Edson and other schools. Yeah, we're working. Yeah, we're working with the building principals and with our buildings and grounds people to see how can we allow. Like, so the YM is a perfect example. Edson, Chambers, and Crosby have used the YM and they're licensed for those buildings. Um, you know, we can easily separate the gymnasium from the rest of the school building. So if the teachers are in there, we have we have uh, um, outside entrances and exits to those gyms. So teachers would never be necessarily, um, you know. Uh, mixing with uh, any students who are there uh, for daycare uh, and the YM has their licensing so they can run their program in our in our spaces and then exit right to the playgrounds, exit right to the fields. So uh, that is a conversation I'm having with the YM and we feel like that's, that, that's probably uh, the best opportunity to serve the most students. Thank you. Mrs. Schwartz? I just had a question to ask about um, feedback. Um, this is wonderful. It sounds great, and, and I know that you've done Yeoman's work to get this ready. Um, are we going to be giving uh, teachers and parents an opportunity to give us feedback um, during the course of the next five weeks? Yeah. Not that we should have to be remote again after that, but um, it's an opportunity. It's definitely an opportunity, and uh, you know, um, 
throughout the process, I haven't had to give people opportunities to give me feedback. I've just been getting it. Um, but, that's, <laughs> but that's to be expected. Uh, but yes. So I mean, one of our, and just with looking down the long term of that, there's the short term length of that, looking down four or five weeks from now, uh, you know, my goal at that time is to be able to pull together teacher leadership, you know, leadership from each of the bargaining units as well as the board and the administration to say, okay, first of all, let's talk about, are we going back? How do you feel about our safety procedures? How do you feel about our protocols? What are things we need to improve? And during this whole time, that's, that's really is Naomi Stevens and Stevenson's job from this point for the next five weeks, that's what she's going to do. She's going around and she's checking to make sure we're following our procedures, asking where the weak points are, making it, making the suggestions and the and the moves to, to uh, strengthen those areas in collaboration with Mr. Parker and myself. So, um, you know, we're, there's going to be a continuous conversation with, as far as safety is concerned and our protocol concerns that are concerned. Um, instruction, again, I'm, I'm going to really rely on our principals and um, uh, you know, Ms. Bondel and, Ms. and Dr. Felicello to continue to conversa have conversations with teachers. As I said, you know, almost 200 teachers were um, brought in to discuss this remote learning plan. Um, and, and it sounds, um, you know, like a crazy thing to say, but in some ways it seems like Teams maybe facilitates that a little more than having people run around to buildings and things. So we're able to grab teachers from every building, from every grade level, and have those conversations. So my expectation is there is regular, there are regular conversations um, with uh, our faculty and staff about that. And I'm going to continue my regular conversations with parents um, through the virtual town halls so we can get feedback from them. Um, I'd like to ask Dr. Collins uh, to respond to what you, your question, your, your answer to um, Mrs. Shear, because Dr. Collins had questions that uh, was maybe going to be brought up at uh, new business, but I think it's appropriate now. Uh, she had questions about a reopening committee. And a lot of what you just said, I think, answers questions that she had that I'd like to give her that opportunity to say that herself, if that's the case. about it really were um, in part to open lines of communication outward just because it's like if a committee that includes stakeholders, parents, teachers, DOE members, district administrators, um, is part are all part of conversing about a solution, whatever that solution is, well, we have so many decisions that will be made um, in the next few months and I really think we'll be making decisions about the long game, not just responding to um, in a triage type of situation. So my thought was that communicating outward becomes that much easier when we have individuals who are part of the solution forming process um, from the get-go. And so I just wondered um, if there's some space to be thinking about a committee that's really going to be addressing all of these facets of our community that we find are the, the issues around schools closing or reopening, whatever remains the case over the next month, um, addressing the fact that so many aspects of our community are intertwined. And so we can, whenever we close schools, we disrupt everything else in the web, and we hear from different stakeholders and different, you know, letters and, and people having meetings, and I, I just wonder if there's a way in which we could be more efficient around both addressing the issues and also communicating those issues that were, um, as if we had a community that included many more of those stakeholders in the conversation from the beginning. So that was an idea I was throwing around. Yeah, I mean, it's something we could, we could work with together. I mean, I think our, our our conversations with our community-based organizations, who are who will really end up being our our you know connections um, to the committee to the committee to our community. They could, you know, again, my conversation with with Drew today was about you know he was he was telling me this is this is these are the people that need this and this is what they need and how can we make that happen? So I think a lot of those conversations happen, maybe just not in a formalized way, um, but we'd easily invite people from 
I mean, it would be a positive thing to invite people from CCD together, from uh, Citizen Action, who, who Jim and I have been working with, um, not as much the last few weeks since it's been crazy, but we started a really good relationship there, um, you know, with the YM, with the, you know, with the city and, and other community organizations that we could bring together to help us um, know more and do more. Mrs. Troy? The other thing that occurred to me, and it kind of goes along what um, Mrs. Shearer or Mrs. Con Dr. Collins were saying. I was wondering, you keep referring to our reopening plan as a living document as well, and I just wonder with this new um, focus plan that's pre-K through 12 and has all of the teachers back in their classrooms, which they haven't been in since March, I just wondered if we have an opportunity to really look carefully about how that reopening might be done um, and not necessarily the, the image that we had had before we had to decide to close. So I just hope that there's space in there for a kind of constant evaluation, which I know you're going to be doing because there's going to be so much that people are going to be attending to uh, to make things better. And I just hope that all of that energy in um, creating the best kind of learning environment, I just would hate to think that we have to be restricted at the end of five weeks to say, well, this is what we decided last time, you know, before this. Yeah. And I just hope that there's always that um, kind of give and take for people to keep thinking, wow, this is working really well here, maybe we could do to continue you know, the success. So I, I just want that out there, I guess. I mean, yep. I'm not being yep. very quick, it's just kind of down from Our initial reopening plan, while we felt it was a, a we still feel it's a, it's a solid plan and the best plan under the best circumstances, that we're not, it's not written in stone. And the fact that we're continuing to go out looking for spaces, um, you know, that would, that we could bring more students in that may change that plan dramatically, right? So if we find a space that's more appropriate for elementary school students than secondary students, that may shift how we put our students and that may open some space in our secondary schools for the older kids. Or if we find a space that is more uh, suitable for the, our older students, maybe that, maybe, you know, our older students have a whole different program in a, in a different space. So we are, um, you know, we're not, we are, that is not written in stone, and we are going to continue to think about that and hope to improve that um, as we as we go through these first five weeks. Um, and my greatest hope is that in week six, um, we are going to in-person, and we, we do have some improvements in our plan, and we can reach as many students in person as possible. Dr. Jacobo, oh, do you have another? Um, yeah, I mean, I Kind of along the same lines. I, I would second Dr. Collins' suggestion about our reopening committee. I think that it might streamline some of the feedback um, that we want to get instead of, um, you mentioned feedback from parents coming from principals, and I can imagine them just being bombarded. Um, and a committee actually might streamline that and make it a little bit um, more cohesive and, and easier for, on the administration. I'd be happy to serve on such a committee, by the way. Okay. I mean, it really sounds like part of the teaching and learning committee. It, it could be if we expanded the scope for a little while. It, it could be, um, but it's a, that's a small committee, um, and we may want to open that up in certain ways. I mean, maybe that's a conversation we can have. Well, I think both Dr. Jacobowitz and Dr. Collins are both on the teaching and learning committee, and, and uh, <laughs> Mrs. Jordan, I believe, is. Uh, and I've lost track of the committee assignments. Mr. Shearer, are you on teaching and learning this year? No, not anymore. Oh, okay. Mr. Jordan. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jordan, you're on the teaching and learning committee. Yes, Groups and they 
they might be great resources. So maybe using the district wide parent council on that capacity Mrs. Jordan, that was going to be turn to me that yeah. you know, because if we just open it up to everyone, it, it's it's more like a town hall if Dr. Catalino wanted to have a um, <laughs> a forum to have everybody on the screen. But I I think that certainly it does make sense to have those people who have so much at stake in this at least have a chance to be together at each other during those next five weeks versus two. Okay. Well, uh, why don't uh, Dr. Collins and Dr. Chilhutz and Mrs. Jordan uh, talk about this uh, among themselves, develop a plan. We have another meeting next week, and um, maybe you can get some feedback from, from Dr. Petalino as well on that idea. Uh, I have a couple of quick, a couple of questions uh, or clarifications. Um, this is sort of just definitional. Synchronous versus asynchronous. Because uh, I know that, I mean, maybe board members know what synchronous and asynchronous is, but we have people watching this from the public, and they may not know it. So when we say that classes are going to be synchronous, that means that the teacher and the students are going to be on teams simultaneously and interacting with each other, right? So that's synchronous instruction. Asynchronous, the teams meetings, the, the synchronous classes can all be recorded. And they'll be able to play back. So if, you're, if a student is in a class and misses it, they will be able to connect to that recorded class, and that will be, and that's asynchronous instruction. Right. And also the asynchronous instruction could be beyond, above and beyond, the, just the recording of a class. It could, a teacher could put an asynchronous, um, you know, activity on, on, you know, up for students to watch at another time. So your homework today is, I've recorded this this little thing and you know whatever they were doing and you know you, you watch that and write a piece about it or something like that. So asynchronous is both the recorded live lessons, but it also can be um, other you know other learning opportunities that are recorded that are interaction. So yeah, and that's one of the things that we did to ensure that in our in our in our highlights PowerPoint that we made sure we we parenthetically put it live and and recorded for synchronous and asynchronous. So um, but yes. In, I just wanted to make sure that everyone Yes, there's a lot of definitions, that. remote learning, virtual learning, online learning, um, all those things have different meanings to different people. So we're trying to stick with the, the definition is, is remote learning is how we're going to describe our program. Okay. Um, and I have another um, question. Um, I believe I read at one of the town halls that Spectrum hadn't renewed their program that was available to families that didn't have internet connection in the spring. And then it seems a day or two later I saw something about a program that they're offering where for families who are uh, free and reduced lunch or in, I think, the, I think it was CEP schools. Now I didn't, it took me a, a few moments to realize what CEP schools are. Um, but let me just go a little bit further. And but those families in that category, in those categories, would be able to get a connection for 19.95 a month. Is that right? 14.95. Oh, even less, an even better deal. Yeah. Um, so free and reduced lunches. I mean, is uh, we all know what free and reduced lunch is. But CEP is, I believe, community eligibility program. Correct. And community eligibility program schools are those schools where 100% of the students get free breakfast and lunch. And I think we have both middle schools, and is it four or five elementary schools? Every elementary school except for Meyer and Graves. Okay, so we have the two middle schools and, and five of the seven elementary schools are community eligibility programs. 
So all of, this, all of the families with students in those schools will be eligible for this $14.99 a month program Correct. from Spectrum. Yes. Um, so I think that's really fabulous. I mean, it's a, it's a, yeah. and it's a huge number of students. So, um, but yes, so our CEP schools, every one of the students, whether they are pre reduced or, or not pre reduced, when students qualify for the, the Spectrum um, deal, that's inclusive. You know, that are both of like everyone in both our middle schools and five of our elementary. So, yes, and we have that information up on our website. And um, you know, I put it out each time I've done my, my town hall. So we're making sure we're getting that information out there. I know, um, you know, phone calls that have come into the tech department. Uh, Gary and his team have been giving parents this information as well. So um, every time we get an opportunity, we're, we're letting people know about that that uh, that deal. I mean, obviously, it's not as good as the free, but it's um, but still a very good opportunity. It's a lot better than forty-five dollars a month or whatever it might mm -hmm. be otherwise. Um, and uh, and so that's probably at least fifty percent of our families fall in that category of being eligible they don't have uh, internet uh, cable internet Correct. connectivity they don't already have it that's the point okay um, and then I have one more question about the re so this is more about the in-person reopening when we get to it so I've been trying to explain to people what the put and I, I think it's Department of Health so there's going to be a protocol for in-person uh, instruction when we get back to it. And I Correct. and the way I've understood it is that if a student comes into school with a symptom of COVID nineteen, then they are considered positive. Is that right? If a student comes in and has symptoms of COVID nineteen, they will be removed from the classroom. Our nurse will do an evaluation, but again our nurses will be erring on the side of if that's you know that that, that it's that we're, we're dealing with a possible COVID student um, positive. So at that point, the student will be removed from the school. The class is, the classmates would be removed from the school. The teacher would be removed from school. The class would be closed. Those people would be quarantined for 14 days while the, while the county uh, conducted testing and contact tracing to ensure there were further um, contacts of those um, 15, 16 people that were in that classroom. So uh, again, that's one of the reasons we're keeping very, um, we're being very diligent about our bus, our bus rolls, uh, you know, our attendance on our buses and where students go, and while we're trying to keep our students <coughs> moving in one single cohort and not in the halls at the same time. But yes, so the assumption of uh, the assumption is always going to be that we have a positive, and um, that was the recommendation of the Department of Health. And with that assumption, we will be sending class classes and students home. Now again, this. The, the recommendations and the guidelines are, are evolving and changing on a daily basis. And so we're hearing the 14 days may be changed to 10, and some of those are some of the rules that we were following the beginning are now being adjusted a little bit. So we're um, as we hear more and work more with Department of Health, and we may make adjustments to that plan. But as of right now, um, you know most most situations will be um, considered positives, and that will be the process we'll follow. Okay, I just wanted to make sure I understood that. Is that coming from the County Department of Health or the that's State from, Department of Health? That's coming from the County Department, the County of, Department Health. of Health. Because that's, when you think about it, that's pretty, that's extreme. Yes. Uh, so someone, a student comes in with, with, with an assumed positive symptom, then the entire class and teacher is out of the building. Right for an extended period of time. Correct. Okay. <coughs> I hope we get to a better situation than that. But As do I. Um, I just wanted to make sure I was explaining it to people correctly when I when I was explaining it. Okay. Uh, One last thing to sure. um, uh, A reminder, if anyone uh, people who can make it, tomorrow at 4 o'clock at Kingston High School, we will have our August graduation, which um, under normal circumstances is usually one of the highlights of our summer, as you all well know. So I think it still will be one of the highlights of our summer. So um, we will be celebrating one graduate tomorrow night. So I encourage all of you to come out and um, congratulate our, 
an August graduate, and uh, we'll be at the uh, entrance at Salzman as where we were last year uh, to uh, provide to present her with her diploma. Mr. Thomas, can I ask one quick question? It's, related, it's a graduation related question. Yes. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to attend tomorrow. August graduation is usually a highlight, and so proud of the students who persist and work hard. Um, Dr. Catalino, do you know what our graduation rate is for, 20, for the 2020 class? Yeah, our grad, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. Um, our graduation rate is about 94%, 93.5%, I believe it is. Um, but we will have the, the total graduation report. Um, I know we're putting that together with our August. Because we actually, so to, be, to give you more detail, we actually had five August graduates, but four of them completed their requirements prior to the July 17th graduation. July 17th and 18th graduation, so they were able to attend and walk with their class in July 17th and 18th. So that there was additional, so I'm getting more, of, I'll get that information back from Mr. Um, DeSico, uh, you know, in the next couple of days, and then we'll have our real calculation, the total calculation. Thank you. Dr. Kev, so what time is the August graduation? Four o'clock. Thank you. Okay. Um, there's no more questions for Dr. Padalino at this time. We'll move on to the Board of Education segment of the uh, meeting. Uh, and we have, uh, I believe we have a report from Mrs. Shear on the Facilities Committee. Is that correct? Yes. Um, I'll make it very brief. We already have wonderful pictures of the um, KHS project and also the, the projects for the Fire Capital. So I'll just uh, skip ahead to the things that we covered that were not covered by the photographs. Um, we met on August 12th and um, on Teams. We uh, got our update on the work that was being done. We welcomed um, KSQ back to the facilities committee. As you know, they were approved by the board for the building condition survey work. Um, we had a report from Dr. Paolino and Mr. Clapper on ready the buildings for opening um, when that occurs in October. Um, uh, we reviewed a draft of a letter to the principals and the head custodians requesting input from them concerns uh, that they still have about their buildings, things that need to be addressed. Uh, we had a discussion of a tentative inspection schedule, and we will be starting in September this year uh, and we'll get the schedule out August 31st. I think the letter of principles and the tentative schedule is going out. I will say one thing. We have a robust committee that goes around to schools, and um, as the facilitator for that committee, I'm on every inspection um, schedule. It's, it's purely voluntary. I don't know, you know, people are so uncomfortable about going into buildings, but um, we really would probably only need one other trustee to attend because we have representatives from um, the architectural firms um, and the, the building uh, construction management firm from uh, our, our director of facilities and also um, we'll be taking photographs at every single building. The principals and the hex studies will be accompanying us. So, um, so there are, I think, eight inspection dates Please feel free to members of the committee and other trustees, but don't sign up for more than one or two. Okay. Um, we also um, did talk about some work that was being done in district at Miller, in addition to the work that you saw, the uh, modular building outside being sited and new ramps were being installed. Um, in addition to that, that expected to be done uh, by the end of the summer. And um, th that's all. Uh, we'll meet again on September 9th at 3.30. And I think that meeting is also going to be on um, Teams. Uh, after that, I don't know. So, and Ms. Shira, if I just I could add one thing to your report, and I'm sorry for not yes. forwarding to this earlier today. We did reserve, receive this morning um, from KSQ their um, draft plan of action for the five-year um, five-year survey, 
Thursday. They have their work plan together and complete with uh, comments from Mr. Clapper and suggestions from Mr. Clapper. And I will forward that to you for uh, a committee report at our next at our next meeting. Yes, thank you very much. And I know the principals were being asked to do double duty because they'll be giving input through the building condition survey and also for um, a regular facilities work. So, sorry, but that happens every five years. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mrs. Scheer. Any questions? Any other questions for Mrs. Scheer? Okay. Um, we have a report from the Audit and Finance Committee. Mr. Michael. Yes, Mr. Shaughnessy. Uh, the Audit and Finance Committee met yesterday, and we had a virtual meeting also on Microsoft Teams, and hopefully could be the last one. I don't know. I hope so. And I have a few things to report. The committee accepted the treasurer's and claims and auditor's report for the month of July 2020, and also have finalized the fund reports for the month of June and for the year 2019 and 2020. Also accepted the fund reports for the month of July. Uh, the committee also accepted the districts uh, fund balance, a reserve fund balance, which is uh, required by the state debt. And uh, also, uh, the committee accepted the taxing and the uh, tax rates for the year 20, 2020, 2021, which is in the agenda tonight for the board to approve it uh, with a vote. Uh, the last thing I want to report is that this is the first year that our community taxpayers will be able to pay their taxes online and can be done with a debit card or a credit card with, of course, a minimal charge. And also, we still, taxpayers can mail in their payments and or they can drop their payment in the glove box on Mahar School. But please, do not enclose any cash, because the mice may bite them. <laughs> so I would like to move on. Uh, for the tax sheet, I would like to say first that the tax sheet among the non homes the homestead and the non homestead uh, tax sheet, it stayed the same in about 11%. And it hasn't changed for the last five, four or five years. It's been the same with the fairness of the homeowners and the businesses. So I leave this now to Mr. Shaughnessy for the a vote on the tax sheet and the tax rates. Uh, those are in, um, those are in uh, the exec in the consent agenda. Uh, oh, they're separated? But you do have BOE 16, the claims audit to report, and the BOE 17, the treasurer's report. Would you like to move those together, Mr. Michael? Yes, Mr. Shaughnessy, I make the motion to accept those. There's one. Okay, and uh, is there a second? Second. Okay. Any questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Extensions, they unanimously adopted. Uh, sure. So I just want to make two two comments. One, I want to reiterate what um, Mr. Michael said, and for board members and for people watching, please communicate that to your neighbors. We are not accepting in person, so people are not coming into the building to pay their taxes. We will have a drop box here at Mahar. We're also taking credit and debit cards and mail in um, payments. Please don't bring cash, and please. Um, you know, just know that we are not taking, um, you know, while we do have people at the door and we do buzz in visitors, and but we are, because we're checking all the, the number of reasons, um, obviously people know what they are in this state of emergency, that we are not bringing large numbers of people into our into our buildings at this time. So I just want to remind people that. I also want to remind, or not remind, but also want to, also at our meeting, we, d we decided that uh, once a year, we are allowed uh, kind of an, uh, an extra audit on a topic of our choice. And um, like a few years ago, we did 
our uh, Section 9 compliance, and one year we did our concussion protocol, so our, our auditors will work on those. This year, on, on Mr. Michael's suggestion, we are going to do an audit on our safety and security procedures. We think that that's an appropriate thing for us to do um, at this time. So um, that, that will be our audit for this coming year at that kind of that extra non, um, you know, non financial audit that we'll be doing. So we're going to look at our safety protocols and procedures um, and efficiencies. So I thank the committee for deciding to do that. It's very timely. Thank you. Uh, I, you know, I think that we are one of the, uh, I think we're the only district in Ulster County where the audit committee uh, does, other than uh, financial audits, and I think it's an, I think it's an important role for the audit and, fi audit and finance committee, or the, you know, the audit committee, because that's the one opportunity that the board has uh, for getting an, a, an independent evaluation uh, of a program or a policy that's important to the operation of the of the district, and uh, it's important for the community to know that we take that responsibility as a board very seriously. And I've had a lot of feedback from people um, complimenting us on the fact that we've done things like our Title IX audit and our and our concussion audits that are a little different than most people use their auditors. So. Um, those are all good things. Um, okay, and then we have the Teaching and Learning Committee, which met. Dr. Chikovitz? Um, The Teaching and Learning Committee met on August 13th. The main focus of that meeting was the reopening plan, which in the two weeks since that meeting has been discussed and discussed and discussed in many town halls, and we just had a conversation about it. So pretty much everything that we just discussed in our meeting has been covered. I would say the two, there were two things that we, additional things that we talked about. One was teacher evaluation and what that will look like in this coming year. Um, we still must follow the APPR and MPPR law as it stands. Um, some of this, some of our ability to evaluate teachers will depend on what happens with the regents exams and with the, um, the 3 through 8 testing. Um, so we'll have to see what happens with that. But as for now, we are still um, needing to follow that law. Um, we also talked about what we're calling KHS Techity, which is a program at the high school that's modeled after a school in San Diego, which is a project-based interdisciplinary form of teaching and instruction. Um, and we are starting to introduce that at the high school level. We have a few teachers who are interested in doing that. We're kind of bring it into the school in this coming year. It probably really won't get off the ground until the spring, um, but it's really exciting. This year's theme is is justice, and there's a mission in the Techity group of anti-racism and trying to find ways to integrate that. So um, it's a really exciting opportunity. Um, it's a great direction for some of our KHS classes, and I'm looking forward to seeing how it's implemented and how it grows in the coming years. Um, we don't have a next date for our next meeting. Mr. Virgin and I need to get together so that we can plan the schedule for the year, um, depending on what the year looks like. So at our next meeting, not at our next meeting, the meeting after that, I should have a list of our TNL meeting dates for the coming school year. Okay. What is the name of the program again? KHS? Equity. Equity? Equity. It's it's an out it's an out um, take or it's a it's an outgrowth of the high high, um, high tech high uh -huh. program uh, where our teachers went out to um, San Diego and, and visited high tech high and they came back and so they've just personalized it um, with uh, you know Miss Bonville and Ms. and Miss Saletti have really pushed this thing and we have some great teachers lined up so uh, so they've changed it and Kingstonized it as I call it and it, and now it's going to be Techwity. I think that's great. I love it. It's very exciting. They've done a lot of work on it. It's very impressive, and it's really exciting for our students and our teachers, I think. Is that trying to say? Yes. Mr. Michael? Uh, something, yeah, it's something I mean to mention about our next meeting. Mm -hmm. The audit and finance committee meeting will be held on September 22nd. Um... Okay, I want to go back to our finance. What you said, Dr. Paolino, about not having uh, in-person uh, uh, payment. Will there be a, uh, a notice in the tax bill to yes. that effect? Yes, there's 
a notice that's going out in every tax bill with it's telling people, you know, exactly the process for paying bills. Okay. That's great. Um, so now we are uh, number eight is 2020-2021 tax shift and tax rates. And um, so we have two resolutions. Um, B11 and uh, I think we have to do B11 first. It's the approval of the Homestead tax shift. And um, so uh, can we have a, a motion uh, to move that resolution to bring so it to the floor? Moved. So moved in a second. And I believe that uh, Mr. Mr. Michael mentioned this, that the approval of the homestead tax shift. So perhaps um, you would like to explain it again, Mr. Michael. The tax shift is a, a portion of the tax that gets uh, uh, reallocated from homestead uh, properties, which are properties of four or fewer uh, apartment units or, or units of, I believe it's four, versus commercial or larger apartment buildings. Right. Well, uh, as I have been on the committee for the last five years, and we have kept that shape to be fair enough for the homeowner and the business, like 11% differential there. So, as I said, you know, it hasn't changed for so long, and we try to keep it the same as we are allowed. And let me say that the reason that we are allowed to do that is because the city of Kingston has a tax shift policy. And um, the proportion of taxable property that's inside the city of Kingston as opposed as a, as a fraction of the entire district is high enough that we can use that, the school district can use that and to apply it to the entire district. Yes, uh, okay, just so people understand that. Um, so, are there any other questions or comments about that resolution, B11, approval of homestead tax shift? Uh, if not, I'll call the question. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Oh, do we need a roll call on the tax shift or the tax warrant? Okay, we'll roll call then on B11. Is it Department? Yes. Yes. Okay, unanimous. Um, then uh, the next resolution is the tax rates for the 2020-2021 school year. Um, it's a lengthy resolution. It's posted on our agenda. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to read it. I'd mangle it by the time I got finished. Uh, but I'll ask for a motion to put it on the floor. And a second, Mr. Michael. Um, so our tax levy limit was 1.73% uh, for this year, I believe. Uh, and when that gets translated to each municipality, uh, it goes up and down uh, and is affected by assessments if your assessment has gone up or down, if your if your assessments within the within a municipality has shifted because one uh, municipality has raised their assessments and another hasn't, 
then that changes it. It's a very complicated uh, uh, calculation to decide an individual property what their tax rate will be. Uh, but just be, a, be uh, <coughs> assured that our business department uh, is very skilled at it, and they do a really remarkable job. So are there any other comments? Just a comment that, as you said, the only number in that calculation that the school district has control of is the tax levy. And our tax levy was 1.73 this year, below the 2% and at the tax cap limit. And it was approved by the voters overwhelmingly. So the levy is approved by the voters uh, at the annual meeting, the, elect the school board election, the school district election. This year was uh, by mail in June. Okay, so, um, and we need to do this by roll call as well. Yes. Yes. Um, just as a reminder, I do need your signatures on the tax warrant. Um. So what, let me let me explain what I think we're going to do here. I don't know if you can see it, but it's you know you sign this every year, um, but since we're um, and we have to do this uh, before I can send out the uh, tax bills. So, um, I'll have the signatures electronically done somehow. Well, we're going to send them. We're going to send out a blank form and the resolution to everyone with the tax rates, uh, uh, and we'll ask you to sign it, to sign your copy. If it, if it was acceptable to the board members, we could bring it to you. So um, yeah, Camille will drive to each of your homes, get your signature, bring it back. I think that may be um, just a quick yeah, morning ride. Yeah, really do need it back quickly, and I think that's the most efficient way for me to get it. Back. Dr. Catalina, Mr. Shaughnessy, maybe you can bring it to August graduation tomorrow. A bunch of us will be there. We can sign it, and, and then um, Mr. Bruno can find the rest of us. Perfect. And then everybody that's not there, uh, Mr. Perno will uh, uh, will catch up with you somewhere. We'll track you down. Okay, that's a great idea. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for contributing to the solution. And now we will have to make sure she reminds me to bring that to the graduation tomorrow. <laughs> Now we move on to the consent agenda. Uh, are there any resolutions that a board member would like to have pulled from the consent agenda? Any resolutions to pull? I'm only going to do it twice. Res can I have a motion to accept the consent agenda? Mrs. Chair, and the second, Mrs. Dewar. Uh, any questions about any item on the consent agenda? Okay, hearing none. Uh, all in favor of the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? So unanimously adopted. Um, do we have we have a donation? So I, Dr. Collins, you've done the donations before, right? I have. So you have another opportunity. Um, we have two. We have, they are both to Harry Edson Elementary. Um, Edson was the recipient of hundred dollars from the Edson PTO, and Edson was also the recipient of two hundred and fifty dollars from the Irish Cultural Center of Hudson Valley. 
So for these donations, the board is very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Uh, next item on the agenda is old business. Is there any old business to discuss? Uh, and new business. Um, so I, actually, I, I, these can just be old business, new business. We have, uh, I think you have some new bu some business to discuss, Mr. Spicer. Yes, I do. I want, I want our community to know the SRO contract discussion is a very serious matter before the board. But the issues of school reopening and all the health and safety and logistical matters that entail forced us to, to postpone this discussion. I would like uh, to plan our first SRO subcommittee meeting for October 5th and an outline for how I would like to move forward with this will be sent out to all board members on September 4th for board review. Okay. Thank you. I look forward to engaging the conversation and appreciate the update, Mr. Spicer. You're very welcome. I, I've heard from a number of you that we should move forward on this. So, uh, th thank you all. Thank you all. So here we go. Okay. I just got reminded by Mr. Lamb that I um, skipped over correspondence in the board committee section. Um, and I think actually that was sort of, I didn't announce it, but I guess it was intentional. One correspondence that we have is a, is a number of letters from students uh, on the SRO uh, question. Uh, and uh, correspondence from, uh, it's much too long to read, and we can't really identify students by name. Uh, but that will go to, Dr. to Mr. Spicer uh, and will be part of the discussion. Uh, on the SRO question. Um, we also have Kingstonian, the pilot, the post pilot agreement for Kingstonian, which has been uh, taken to the uh, Officer County Industrial Development Agency. Uh, and their proposal has been accepted by the Kingston Common Council. Um, and um, actually, and we'll, we'll distribute these tomorrow at the, uh, for those who go to the graduation. We have 20-page uh, booklets from the developers uh, explaining the project. Yeah, but there's also hard copy, right? Oh, I thought, okay. Yes. How we receive the official pilot pro, you know, program from the developers, officially received one? Um, actually, the only thing that we've had official is the term sheet that was approved by uh, Common Council. Um, okay. So, have we received it officially? Has we have it. I don't think that we have an official communication from the developers on it. Am I okay. correct on that? Yes. We don't. Um, so um, the proposal is for a deviated pilot uh, of 25 years. Uh, and there's a lot of controversy about it. We've gotten a lot of communication, a lot of letters, correspondence in the last two months uh, from people in favor of it uh, and people who are questioning it. Uh, and those people are not necessarily opposed to it, uh, but they want more information. Uh, the developers have uh, offered to make uh, 
presentation uh, to the board. They want to do it. They wanted to do it confidentially because they have want to discuss with us the justification for it, which includes what they consider uh, trade secrets and uh, other confidential matters. Uh, we have discussed this with our attorney, and we cannot accommodate them with that request um, because we can't. It's not a it's not a topic that we can consider uh, in executive session. It's, it's not a legitimate reason for uh, calling executive session. Uh, so we will have to let them know that. Uh, and uh, so one proposal is that we uh, sort of turn this over to uh, Dr. Padalino and Mr. Olson. Uh, Mrs. Jordan, you have, you have a concern that you want them to address. Would you like to uh, describe that? Well, I just want to know what the impact is on the taxpayer. And so, um, you know, I certainly think it's a worthy project, and I hope they're very successful. I just need, as a board of ed member, to be assured that there will not be an additional burden on taxpayers particularly those who don't live in the city of Kingston. So I had requested some more information regarding that specific. And also compare it to what the tax uh, tax burden might be if nothing was done. So that we can show the taxpayer that we are taking into consideration uh, their needs as well for all the taxpayers. So that's Okay. Um, is there um, and actually uh, we also heard from our attorney that we can't have more than one uh, board member involved in discussing it with uh, developers otherwise we have a, uh, a a board committee and any uh, discussion of the board committee would have to be done in public is that right? So, uh, if they want to, um, if they want to discuss their confidential and trade secrets, they have to do it with Dr. Padalino and Mr. Olson uh, and one board member. And um, I don't know who the board would like to nominate or appoint as being the board member uh, who would be involved in those discussions. Uh, Is that a question on the floor? It could be a question on the floor. Then I nominate James Michael. I think James has a good background. He's been working with it for two years now. And so I would second that motion. Okay. We have a... We have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? I'll be sure that you accept. Okay. Without a very close, we appreciate that since you have the job now, Mr. Mike. Well, we haven't voted on it yet. Vote if you if you want to. Okay, so we will we will vote on it. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. I'm going to say I accept the nomination and the uh, argument to me. Uh, as I said from day one, when I started, you know, serve on the board, I have always said uh, uh, the taxpayer is a unique question of the education, and I always try to protect the taxpayer and community as a whole and be fair and equitable for everyone. So I will try to do my best to serve my community and the community taxpayer. Well, that's good. I'm, and I'm sure the developers are glad that I wasn't appointed because I've been a, a vocal. <laughs> person uh, with a lot of questions about it. So it's on Mr. Michael. 
Uh, and that settles that item of new or old business. Uh, board, member, board member announcements. Wait, I do have oh. one. Okay. Well, Mr. Lamb hasn't done it yet either? No, he has the band license. He can't use the band excuse this year. Okay, so I think that we need to um, catch up a little bit then. Were you planning to attend the, uh, uh, Mrs. Scher, you have a comment? Yeah, I have. Well, it's along the same lines. Um, since we're talking about delegates, we, we haven't really talked about the resolutions. Uh, so are we going to discuss them in case there are any that we would like to amend? Have we received the resolutions yet? Yeah. And I'm not even sure of when the dates are, right? I mean, it's going to be it's going to be over an extended period, and it's going to be virtual. Yeah. And I don't know when the um, the business meeting is will be conducted, but that's what we need the delegate for for the business meeting. Uh, and uh, I have to let them know that. Okay. Uh, so can we, uh, will you, would you accept that responsibility, Mr. Lamb? Hello? He's feigning that he doesn't hear us. <laughs> you're, you're, up, you're muted. You're muted. You're muted. What was that, a yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, so, let me go back to a, a, two more items of new business. Uh, one of them is that we, and this is really difficult this year, uh, we were supposed to uh, approve superintendent goals by September 10th of each year. And um, in years past, Dr. Patalino has always been very early in uh, proposing goals for the for the upcoming year, and this is uh, I guess we still have to follow it, right? But uh, uh, I don't know what the goal would might what what his goals might be. Get through the year. <laughs> uh, I will I will have I've been, I've been putting some things together and. We'll have them um, in the board's hands for next week's meeting for you to consider my, you know, and then you can, for my um, thoughts. Okay. Uh, and I don't know if we, we have a board meeting on uh, September 2nd, next Wednesday, and we have a board meeting then on September uh, 16th. Is that right? So, uh, and we normally have the, uh, Dr. Palino's goals presented to us, uh, and then we have a, a, a meeting to, an interval to consider them and then vote on them for the next, uh, at the next meeting, but that would be uh, after September 10th if we followed that. But I think that we could follow that and we wouldn't get into a lot of trouble. Is that okay with everybody? Mrs. Schwer? Well, we could, um, you know, if Dr. Pettino is working on he's willing to share the draft with us, we could come with the draft in the library and actually discuss it and decide on, on, on September 2nd. Okay. So we could do that as well. And I would be comfortable agreeing to the six day <laughs> extension if the board wanted to wait for the six day. That's not. So we can decide that next Wednesday, I guess. I <coughs> uh, will not come after the board for breach of contract. Okay. 
or the SED won't come after us for breach, breach of regulation. Uh, and then we have a goal setting committee uh, that the board will, we have that committee announced, right, appointed. And so that committee will have to meet after, uh, after we adopt the superintendent's goals uh, to establish the uh, a proposed set of uh, board goals uh, to present to the entire board for adoption. Uh, and we will do that. Uh, we will shoot for the uh, first meeting in October to, to adopt those board goals. Does that sound okay? Everybody? Okay, so those are the two items of new of business that I overlooked. So now we, I think we can go I to. One, I have one new business question. Okay. Um, the governor made an announcement recently about the about budgets and holdbacks, and I was just wondering if Dr. Pedrino could comment about that. Thank you, Dr. Jacobus, for opening that. Um, yes, the the governor recently um, announced that they will be withholding 20 percent of our first state aid payment um, and that the possibility is that that 20 percent could become permanent um, and it will could continue uh, throughout the next you know the next quarter for the next four quarters um, we are uh, that right now that puts us in a situation where there's about 3.5 million dollars in state aid being withheld for this quarter and the potential for about 14 million dollars being withheld and or um, reduced from our budget. Uh, that is coupled with the uh, about $1.1 million that was withheld um, from last year's budget. So they withheld aid from last year from money that we had already spent. Uh, so at Mr. Olson's recommendation, we are using parts of our unreserved fund balance to cover that last year's loss. So we even the books, which we are you know, supposed to do at the end of the year. Um, you know, that was a little bit of a surprise to see the cut to our final aid payment um, in 2019-2020 come in like that. But uh, we did have to balance the books to end the year, so we did that with fund balance. Hopefully, um, again, that was not necessarily a cut. That was a withholding. Um, we're hoping that, you know, it, that money will come back from last year. If it does, it will roll over back into our unreserved fund balance for next year. So we are, um, yeah, we are working on... Uh, a lot of different scenarios around a lot of the different possibilities of the cuts and the withholding. Um, so yeah, it, I mean it's 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 crisis mode if if these withholdings turn into um, actual reductions in state aid. But we are uh, again working. It's early. We're working on possible scenarios and what we can do. So um, I will keep you keep you posted. Okay. Thank you. Uh, board member announcements. Oh, Mrs. Jordan, do you have a question or a comment? I'm Dr. Jacobowitz's question. Um, is this money that the state is hoping to recoup from the federal government? There are two things I think. I mean, I, I'd say yes, yes. This is money that they're hoping to recoup from the federal government, um, and all and also hoping that, um, you know, the state economy as far as, um, you know, recovering from um, the pandemic moving forward. So the state revenues will go up. So as the governor said in the spring, he's going to reduce our, um, and it's not just schools. So let's be clear about that. It's everything in the state across the board. And there's, um, so we, so he'll be reducing aid and or in this case holding the aid in hopes of two things. One, federal um, assistance, and then also a recovery in the economy that will bring the state's revenues to a place where they can uh, start making good on the budget from uh, that was that was passed by the state in April um, of 2020. So it, yeah, it's a combination of things. Thank you. Any other? Uh so I guess that was really sort of new business, right? Mm -hmm. uh, board member announcements? The 
If I were to make an announcement, I would just announce that this reopening process has been exhausting. So, and I, I appreciate the work that Dr. Padalino and the administration has done, uh, and uh, that they will have to continue to do uh, to make this work. Uh, there's no other announcements. So next meeting will be September 2nd. Uh, we're going to try to do the review of the um, uh, board staff evaluation at a second executive session at the end of the public meeting uh, next week. Uh, and uh, uh, other than that, uh, entertain a motion for adjournment. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So thank you very much for participating. Mr. Michael, did you have something to say? No, I guess I wanted to say uh, good to see you all again. And happy good night. Thank good you. Night. Good night. And I hope to see some of you tomorrow at graduation. Bring your mask. <laughs>